I am speaking with Peter Rivera. Hi, Peter, and how are you? Oh, I'm just real good, thank you. How did you get involved in music to begin with? Uh, when I was 10 years old, a guy came knocking at the front door, and he was selling uh, music lessons for a place called Meet Mr. Callahan, and he talked his way into the house to test uh, my parents' kids to see if we had musical, uh, if we were, had a musical ability. And he sang two notes, one real high, one real low. And he said, is the second note lower or higher than the first? I went, well, it's lower. And he tur turned to my mother and he goes, your son shows a remarkable aptitude for music. <laughs> so it was, a, you know, it was a, oh, my little darling's going to play an instrument. And this place had mostly, I think, 95, 99% of the students were all accordion players. <laughs> well, and this is Detroit, right? This is Detroit. Meet Mr. Callahan's, yeah. And and so I went there, and, they, and we talked about what to play, and I went, I don't know what I want to play. I don't know if I even want to play anything. And my dad had, like, taught me how to play spoons when I was, like, five years old, and I did a show in a big auditorium playing the spoons to a song called If You Knew Susie. Well, you know, little five-year-old kid, I mean, who doesn't like that? So here it was five years later, he's selling. I says, well, why not the drums, you know? And they said, okay, the drums. So my lesson started the next week, half-hour lesson once a week. The, the lesson was, was $3. And I went in. Uh, my dad took me, and, uh, you know, I just drumsticks on a rubber pad. Yeah. That's what it was. And about I took three lessons and quit. <laughs> Because uh, the guy was trying, you know, he was from Europe, and he had broken English, and he was trying to teach me the absolute proper way. And, and the minute I did anything that was on my own, you know, he had come down on me, and I thought, you know, this is baloney. I don't want to bother with this. So I quit and then uh, got a snare drum. That's all we could afford at the time, and I would sit in the basement and play to my dad's 78 RPM records. And then I got, I had a paper route and I managed to talk my folks into getting me a set of drums and I would play those drums to those 78 RPM records to Glenn Miller and Benny Goodman and Stan Kenton and, and then I finally bought a record by Little Richard called Tutti Frutti. Mm -hmm. And then I bought Blue Suede Shoes by, uh, by Carl Perkins. And just those are the only two records I own, and I played them over and over and over, and I just played in the basement. I'm like 12, 13. Then I joined up with a, a two guys in school who both played guitars. There were the three of us. We called ourselves the Sultans. Uh -huh. We thought we were all that in a bag of chips till we were about 16 years old. And then this band that had already... It's a neighborhood band, but they had graduated from high school already, they were, so they were older. They saw me playing at a church social with the Sultans, and they approached me and asked me to join their band. And this was big time. So, I mean, they had like four shows a year, yeah, which was big time. So I joined them, and we began rehearsing in the basement, you know, three, four days a week, and... Uh, Finally got a, a, a teen hop and a, another sock hop, and we did a, a wedding and a graduation and we kind of getting cool. And then they were like 20 years old. I was 18, and we got fake ID and worked our way into a nightclub in Detroit that had no people. There were more people on stage than there was in the club, and it was <laughs> it was a dive on the east side of Detroit. And uh, about two months later, we had lines out the door. Because the band was good. We practiced hard, and we were called the Sunliners. Yeah. And that, that started in 1960, right? Yeah, right about 60, yeah, 59, 60, yeah. Because I graduated high school in 62. Uh, wow, that's going back. In 62, <laughs> and uh, a couple years later, you know, that's when we started in the clubs. And uh, when you got to 1968, which is really the definitive year, I guess, uh -huh. um, uh -huh. Changed the name of the band from the Sunliners to uh, Rare Earth. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, the legends were made. Well, the, we yeah we still played in De in Detroit and Lansing at at uh, Michigan uh, you know University up there in Lansing and uh, back and forth went to New York and did some fun things 
And what we got really big in Detroit. We got to be like the top band, club band. Mm-hmm. And it was only a natural occurrence that somebody from Motown eventually would get wind of us. Uh, you guys weren't the first white band that was signed by Motown. Actually, the Rustics were signed before you, but they really didn't do so well. And uh, they signed you guys. They signed Rare Earth, and they actually named the uh, that version of, of Motown after Rare Earth, right? Yeah, Rare uh, Motown was primarily a, you know, a black record company and, and uh, as everybody knows and the couple of people in administration were trying to convince Barry Gordy that this new world of rock and FM radio and college radio and all the English acts that it was a big market for that, and they were not in on it. So they decided to come up with a new label and put about five or six acts on the label and launch this whole new label to the industry. And it, they wanted a name for it, and we were already Rare Earth. We said, well, why don't you call it Rare Earth Records? And so they decided to do that. And they bought um, four or five masters from England, the Pretty Things and a couple others, and uh, came out with the label, Rare Earth. And we were on that first set of releases. Uh, we we kind of hit it. The other groups really didn't. Uh, as far as the Rustics go, if I'm not mistaken, the Rustics was put together by a, a couple of the staff Motown writers and, and producer, uh, producers and yeah. arrangers. Uh, but we were the first white band that was a band on our own that was brought into the company. Okay, and, and you had from 1970 to 71, uh, you, you guys, you tore it up. Uh, Get Ready yep. was at, peaked at number four on Billboard's Hot 100. Yeah, when we came a second album, we came with Born to Wander, and then we had Losing You off the second album. Mm-hmm. And then we had Hey Big Brother as a single release, and then we had I Just Want to Celebrate, and our album's... We're doing real good, and, and uh, uh, yeah, Get Ready was a big record. You know, the funny thing about it is, is as we were touring, we'd go into, let's say we went into St. Louis, and the St. Louis record charts, we were number one. Yeah. In the, in the Omaha charts, we were number two, and then in, the, in, in somewhere in Nebraska, or I mean, you know, like Denver, would be number one. So we were one and two, one and two, one and two, but at the same time, Billboard, we were number four. We could mm-hmm. never figure that out. And I think <laughs> Evidently, St. Louis doesn't count in Billboard, right? Well, I don't know. I think what it has to do with is that some companies, I won't say who, they might not want you to know that your ranking is actually higher because you might be a little more careful about what kind of royalties they're paying you. I see. I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying. Yeah, in 71, yeah, I just wanted to celebrate. Came out, peaked at number seven. Hey, Big Brother, yeah. at peaked at number 19. Yeah. Um, after after the success, uh, and with Motown, uh, you guys, Motown decided to move to California, and you guys pretty much moved with them. Yeah, although we didn't want to, but I mean, it was like on Tuesday, Motown's in Detroit, and on Wednesday they were gone. I mean, it was just crazy, and. So our manager, you know, convinced us all to move out there. Some of us didn't want to because, you know, music is a funny thing. It can be reflective of where you live as to what kind of attitude is conveyed in the music. Mm-hmm. I believe that. And a couple guys believe that by going to L.A., we might, you know, uh, be changing horses uh, when we shouldn't be. And uh, it proved out to be somewhat true because there's a lot of distractions when you go out to the beautiful, sunny Los Angeles, Hollywood. Yeah. You know, and, and in Detroit, when you had your winter times, well, the, the only thing you wanted to do was stay in the rehearsal hall and work and learn and, mm-hmm. and, and, and all that. And then out to L.A., here comes the palm trees and, and all kinds of diversions. And, uh, so, but Motown did move out there. Uh, we went out there and never had too much to do with their offices anymore because they were up in a high rise. We just went mainly to the Motown studios and then home and then on the road for shows. In 1974, the the group basically broke up. And yeah. uh, you, uh, with uh, Ursula and Baird, you formed Hub. Yes. And you uh, recorded two albums for Capitol Records. 
Um, unfortunately, in 1975, uh, Baird was killed in a boating accident, That's which correct. really kind of, uh, that was it for Hub. Uh, that was it, yeah. It was really it for Hub before that, because what happened was is Barney Ailis had called us back into Motown. Tom Baird was a producer of Rare Earth. He's the one mm -hmm. who celebrated a big brother. He wrote Born to Wander, and he was like another member. Right. Uh, so when, when I left Rare Earth, uh, I called Tom, and, and, of course, Mike left too. We put the hub thing together, and we went into Motown. We were recording uh, these these two al this album, and uh, all of a sudden it was announced that Barney Ailes, the, one, the president of Motown, was going to be leaving Motown. And he, and he formed Prodigal record, record. Right. Yeah, yeah. But on the on the Hub albums, he called his friend Al Corey over at Capitol, and he dished us off to Al Corey. Mm -hmm. So Al Al uh, uh, respected our contract. So we went over there, and we completed the two albums. And just on the completion of the second album, it was announced that Al Corey was leaving Capitol. And the person that took over, I can't remember his name right now. It's a name I want to forget because of what he said to me. But we, he went over, we went over to Capitol and after Al Corey left, he come up to me and he says, I never liked Rare Earth. I don't think I ever will like Rare Earth. I'm going to release these albums because contractually I have to. But don't expect any promotion, guys. Wow. How about that? Wow. So Talk then, about the big diss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that was really something. So the Hub albums never had a chance. That's what I was saying. And then Barney, I think, went back to Motown and asked us back in there on the Prodigal, and we got Rare Earth back together and took a stab at an album with James Carmichael producing. Mm -hmm. And uh, not too much happened with that because it was – it was not a rare earth sound anymore, you know. The way we got our sound before and hits before was the six of us worked really hard and got these grooves going on, and we were kind of tight. Mm -hmm. and we got to a point where our albums were becoming more sterile produced, uh, different producers taking different shots at us, trying to take us somewhere else. And, and put us into something different. And we, we had lost our unity by then, so we were easily led away into these other, you know, these other production techniques and things, and it just didn't work. In 77, uh, you guys assembled again with uh, producer John Ryan. Yeah. And uh, you worked on, began work on two new albums, and... Uh, uh, the band together in Grand Slam, Grand Slam. I'm sorry, both released in '78. Yeah. Um, you had one hit out of that warm ride that peaked at number 39. Yeah, well, I tell you, uh, there's a case in point. John Ryan taking us into the studio and bringing in all kinds of songwriters, and, and John was pretty cool. Uh, John probably expected us to put more into us than we were, so he had to eventually. Uh, you know, he wanted to get the albums done, so he had to bring in some other players and uh, take us somewhere. And then we kind of found out that, uh, you know, we, we may not get promotion on those albums, too. So John hurried up real quick, and we did two albums in, like, three months. Wow, that's fast. Oh, man, it was just one song after another, after another, after another. And then it was thought, okay, we need some... So here comes this thing about we had some connections with the, with the, with the, uh, Gibbs and uh, Maurice uh, right. Rob, uh, yeah with the Bee Gees. I'm sorry, yeah, Bee Gees, yeah. And uh, so this song was suggested that we do this warm ride thing. Well, we did that and a couple other ones. And I guess they Barney and the guys they liked the, that uh, warm ride. Mm-hmm. But it was amazing to me how Warm Ride came out and went right to number 40. I never thought that it was going to be a hit record for us. I thought it sounded a little too much like the Bee Gees were our background singers. But they weren't. You know who was? The Hudson Brothers. Oh, really? Yeah. So we, I did not know that. Yeah, we did the Warm Ride thing, and, and uh, it came out, and it was. I, I think it was, I think the record company pulled in some favors. 
to get that thing to show up at number 40 right away in hopes that that would make it catch on. But I don't think Warm Ride was real uh, reflective of what Rare Earth used to be. You know, we were a real hardcore hitting band, and Warm Ride was was smooth, you know. It was kind of just not us. But anyways, that's the way life goes. And uh, finally, by uh, September of 1983, uh, things were really falling apart. Um, and by the end of that year, uh, you had left. Yep. And... Uh, and uh, formed the uh, – and well, I'm going to jump ahead here. Uh, yeah. Because you formed – in 1992, you formed the Classic Rock All-Stars. And, I mean, what a lineup you had. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Well, Mike Panera, for, who had Ride Captain Ride with Blues Image, he had left them and gone on to play with Iron Butterfly in Agata Vida. Mm -hmm. And so he was doing things. And Jerry Corbetta, who was the piano player and singer of uh, Sugarloaf, Green Eyed Lady was one of his big ones, Don't Call Us, We'll Call You. Right. They were on a tour called The 30 Years of Rock, and they had enough of that bus ride. So they they left that, and uh, they talked it over, called me, and we went and had a coffee and said, hey, what about having a band where we... You know, we do Ride Captain Ride and Get Ready and Green Eyed Lady and we'll get a bass player and and so we did. And we did a couple a couple of shows that were kind of fun and then a couple more and a couple more. Pretty soon we said, Hey, we got calls coming in. So we got an agent going on and we started in nineteen ninety two and we just quit last year. So it went seventeen years. Wow. And we played, oh, geez, for years it was great. We'd play 70, 80 shows a year. Everybody was coming home, you know, paying all their bills and, and having a little bit of pocket money left over. So it was a good thing. We had a lot of fun, played a lot of places, and uh, uh, it went along just great until about 06. And when that economy crunch came, mm -hmm. the show's... Uh, started, you know, diminishing in, in, in the amount of shows, and then money got tighter, and things got a little tougher, and so uh, we were still hanging in there till 2010, and our, our bass player at the time uh, left the band. He actually passed away, and we got a replacement for him, and we continued in 2010, and things were pretty cool. There wasn't a lot of shows, but we were still having fun. And then all of a sudden, Jerry, bless his heart, was was diagnosed with dementia, and he had to pull out. Yeah. And 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 the bass player that we were using could not commit solely to us because he lived in Detroit. He had to work lots of other places because we didn't have enough shows for him to make his year. If you know what right. I mean. Yeah, I do. So now that left Mike and I, and uh, you know. There comes a time when you, you have something for like 17 years. I just I just thought it over, and I said, you know, I don't want to redo the All-Stars because we're trying to redo the same name in a, in a down, down economy, and it's been a long time, and we've played all the venues. i got to do something else. And if I'm in the twilight of my career, and I there's a lot less in front of me than there what is behind me, and so I wanted to, not from an ego standpoint, but I just wanted to be able to do uh, things that I've always wanted to do musically. And that is, uh, you know, just uh, writing songs. And years ago in the 90s, I moved out of L.A. and I went up to a city called Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. I raised my kids uh, till 2003. While I was there, I used to drive into Spokane, 30 miles away, I drive in and I got in with this company and I did a lot of commercials and singing. Mm -hmm. Well, as a result of doing that for a few years, I met a lot of players, really nice guys, really good players. So when we went back in 03, uh, it was just in 09, six years later, our kids were gone and I told my wife, we both decided we wanted to move. Right. Where are we going to go? I says, well, why don't we go up to Spokane? And this was happening right at the time Jerry had gotten. So we moved up to Spokane in 09. Jerry had to pull out in late 09. And uh, 
that was it for the Class of Rock All-Stars. And I'm up here, and I've reacquainted with the, all the musicians up here. I have a little studio in my house. We write together. I've recorded an album with them. I've got 10, other, 10 or 11 songs now on CD Baby, brand new songs, and I, I wrote them all. And the guys come over here, and we record, and we do... We do all this good stuff, and I do shows with uh, we we Joe Brash, the guitar player, uh, who's phenomenal. This guy does fifty, sixty guitar students every week. He's the guy. Uh, we did a thing for the food bank in Spokane. We stood on the corner, we sang songs. Danny played keyboards, and Danny's a professor. Danny McCollum, professor of keyboards at the university here, and uh, so the three of us did this. Uh, food bank on the corner and raised money to give to the food bank. But we had so much fun doing it. I said, hey man, let's go, let's work on this a little bit. So we took all the rarest songs and revamped them unplugged. Yeah. And I went out and I did some shows and got standing ovations and I went, oh, wow, this is really fun. So my focus now is on the songwriting, my three piece unplugged, but I do have a band that I call Celebrate. And that's a full-blown uh, eight-piece band with three girl singers and percussion. It's a great show, but in this economy, kind of tough to sell it. We do get corporate shows. We've been to some pretty exotic places with the big band. But the little band, the unplugged thing, you know, we travel around, do shows with that. So that's what I'm doing currently. When did you come out with the album Being There Doing This? Uh, that was only about, oh, I think about... Uh, Came out of like January, February, and, and uh, the song you well get ready's on there. You've got a lot of the good classics that are on there. Get yep. ready, Ma, in bed. What I say, but it's all, road. It's all done unplugged, and that in bed was a song that Rare Earth did on our first album. Right, but we did it kind of in a rocky way, mm-hmm. and, then, and the way we did it on this unplugged, we do it in a really kind of a mellow, intimate kind of a semi jazz way. It's kind of cool. And uh, so I, I did all the hits, and I revamped some songs that I feel we undershot or overshot on some early albums. And with the abilities of Joe Brash on guitar and Danny McCollum on keyboards, they present the music in a whole new light. It's a real sophisticated kind of a feel. And these guys are outstanding. So I said, man, let's go do an album. So we did an album in three days, man. Wow. Yeah, we did that. <laughs> and then I got Russ Tarana to fly in from Monterey. He's the retired guy. He's got 91 gold singles. He was the mixing and mastering engineer at Motown mm-hmm. for all those, you know, 150 years. 150 years. <laughs> he's got all these gold and platinum albums on his wall. <laughs> so he came in. He's an old buddy. He was in the Sunliners. When they hired me when I was 17 years old. And he went on to be Motown's greatest mixing engineer. He did everybody, Diana Ross. Everybody. He was the guy. And uh, so I, he, I called him up. I said, Russ, I got this album. Would you come in? So he came in, went to a beautiful studio here. The whole band, everybody stayed there. They've got living quarters, beautiful. My wife came out, cooked all the food every day. They've got a, a commercial kitchen in there. And we did the album in like three, four days. Young artists listen to my show. And this is one thing I like to ask uh, during my conversations is that, you know, things have changed in the in the recording industry so much, yeah. you know, over the last 20 years even. Um, you know, the the studios, the, the big studios, are they're not doing artist development anymore. No. Uh, they're not handing out the bags of cash anymore. Um, well, they are if you're they are if you're 16 year old with a great body and you're female. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but my que- my question to you is is uh, what kind of, for for a young artist that's, that's out there trying to get his or herself noticed? They're uh, they're practicing their craft, they're mastering their craft, and they want to get their music out there and heard and uh, and get folks to listen to it. What would your advice be to them? Wow, what a question. Um, my advice, my advice would be that it's, you know, it's such a big, big world out there that you've got to stay real true to yourself and do your thing. Unless you're in a band, then you have to collectively decide what is our thing. 
But if a guy is by himself or a girl is by themselves and they write their own songs and they sing them, they got to stay true to themselves, practice, listen to records, listen to the big stars, listen to how they sing, how they breathe, how they uh, express. Uh, and also, be honest enough with yourself to know that, uh, you know, every song you write is not going to be phenomenal. And, and, and just keep on going. There are things that are happening now out there where you can broadcast yourself from your own laptop over the internet. And you can announce that broadcast to all of your social network, uh, feeds, your Twitters, your Facebooks. Mm -hmm. And that's the way the world's going now. And this, uh, this first platform that's out there, and I don't own it, I, I sure wish I did, it's called Stage It. Right. S-T-A-G-E-I-T dot com. And virtually anyone can go on there from their living room, their bedroom, their studio, a concert hall, anywhere, all over the world, at any time, and set up a show that they do. It doesn't cost them a dime. And as a matter of fact, through their social networks, they can invite all these people to come watch their show, and these people buy little tokens. They only uh -huh. have to spend five bucks, and you get 50 tokens. And you can spend those tokens anywhere you want. So let's say that you come to that stage and you see Peter Rivera on there. And I'm going to do a show, as I am tonight, at 7 o'clock. It'll be a 30, 35-minute show. You can pay whatever you want to pay. You want to pay me 10 tokens? That's a dollar. Mm -hmm. on pay of your 50. Now you got 40 left in your bank, you can go see somebody else. Well, this is going to be revolutionary, I believe, because it's going to allow anybody to go out there and do their 20, 30 minute show, and that's called exposure. And you, and put your songs on YouTube. Just sit there with your guitar, film it, stick it on YouTube, because you, the idea now is there isn't any more plastic, there isn't any more vinyl discs. There's not, I mean, CDs anymore. It's all downloads. It's all going to right. be, it's all going to be in the air, airwaves, the, the internet. I mean, that's where it is. So get in there and just stick yourself in there wherever you can and practice, practice, practice. If, uh, you could, if you could change anything, if you could, Change anything during the course of, of, of your career, uh, with, uh, you know, rare earth or currently whatever, uh, what would you do different? I'll tell you what I would have done. I'm at much, I'm as at much fault as anybody is for the demise of our band. I wish that I would have been able to take my pride and, and put it, just bury it somewhere and sacrifice more to help the band come together by being vulnerable and sincere and without pride and all that, because I'll be honest with you, I got my dandruff up too. Mm -hmm. and, we all, and, and the main thing I would change is I would kind of make a pledge with the band to trust each other and stay together, because what happened was, and I think it's what happens with a lot of groups, here you are, you're a group, you're in a city, you practice, you're tight, you're all together, all for one, one for all, you know, you're like a team. When you get some popularity going on, everybody starts developing their own little circle of friends. And these right. friends are going, you know, Bill, you're really the guy in the band. And over here, this little group is going, you know, Chuck, you're really the guy in the band. And so... We all let these outside people in, and they're well-meaning people. They're just fans, too, and friends. But all of a sudden, you start developing the egos, the jealousy, and you start going, well, hey, you know, he's getting a lot more attention than I am. And what the heck, I'm in the band, too. And here comes a little bit of an argument, a little bit of a standoff. It's kind of like how a divorce starts in a marriage, you know? Yeah. And, and you gotta be, you gotta treat it like a marriage. If you're in a band, you've gotta forgive and realize that the other person has got faults. You gotta overlook them. You can't dwell on them because it'll break you up for sure. That's what right. it does to everybody. And uh, I mean, that's the only advice I can give is that I wish I would have worked harder at keeping that together because we had a good thing. And like I said, it was all of our faults and mainly 
the drugs is, didn't help it at all. You know, there was a times you were out there and you wanted more excitement and you looked for more, well, excitement. So you you went for it. And yeah. Yeah. for my listeners that want to find out more about you and your music, uh, where should they go? Well, my website is PeterRivera.com. Uh, that's my website. Uh, my music is all over, is on CD Baby under Peter Rivera, all my new stuff, all the rarer stuff, uh, for years, and even some of my new, uh, shows are all on YouTube. I mean, you type in Peter Rivera, there'll be a four page menu there. So, cool. you know, and then I got it, you can email me through the, my webpage if you got certain things you want to ask, I'd be glad to answer it. And I plan on over the next few months getting into a position where I'm broadcasting an awful lot on the internet and take questions and everything. I got some ideas so that I can, and you know what? At this stage of my life, I'm like a new artist now. I mean, Good. everybody goes, hey Pete, we remember that old stuff and we love that, but where are you now? I Some kids might feel like they've got a couple of strikes against them. I feel like I got 2.98 strike against me because yeah. Not only have I did it years ago, but I'm older now. And wiser. I, well, I'm, I'm, I don't know, am I wiser? I don't know, but I'm a lot older, and that isn't real. You know, that's, that's, a, that's a strike, seriously. I mean, who, who wants to hear about, you know, well, this old guy's got new songs out there. But you see, I believe it in my heart. I believe, and I hope I never stop believing, that I got something in here. Right. That you're going to like. And Good. I got to keep believing that. Hey, thank you very much, Peter. You bet. My pleasure. It's been a real pleasure having you on my show. Okay, well, great. My absolute honor. Well, thank you very much. Anytime, anytime.